So um, this is our seventh talk of the semester, and we're very excited to welcome uh, Professor Brian Johnson from the University of Washington. Uh, Brian had attained his PhD from uh, UIUC in 2013 and spent some time working at NREL before starting at Washington. Um, we're really excited to have him for the Power and Energy series because his research spans both power electronics and power systems. Um, I believe this talk today will be more focused on power electronics, but uh, we will see. Brian, right on. take it away. All right, thanks, Keith. Uh, yeah, so this talk will be a bit more on the power electronics side of things, but yeah, just a little bit about myself. Yeah, I, I, another branch of my work is kind of merging power electronics and power systems. So if any of you are um, passionate about that topic, you can feel free to reach out to me on the side. Okay, so um, today I'm gonna be talking about uh, decentralized control methods uh, for this uh, notion of switch interleaving in multi-converter systems. And before we jump into the technical side of things, just a couple of things to point out real quick. So just to acknowledge the uh, generous funding, this is part of a project from uh, the Department of Energy. And the, uh, the graduate student at UW who really was uh, the person behind all this is, is Soham Dadas, who is here. And this project is, uh, has many facets to it and is part of a broader collaboration with, uh, with CU Boulder and NREL. So I wanna mention their contributions to this, um, this overall project, this is part of. Okay, so the general theme here is that we're looking at uh, developing a control method here that is versatile and can be used in many settings. Now, the key thing that drives whether or not this method I'm about to show you is applicable is whether or not you're looking at uh, a multi-converter system or not. So multi-converter systems appear all over the place. So if you series connect things to build up to higher voltages, you'll see this appearing in what are called solid state transformers where your series connecting to get up to uh, medium voltages, which is several kV and above that. Uh, modular multi-level converters are for um, pretty large grid scale settings to go even higher in voltages. And, um, and then switching away from power grid applications, we also have data centers where people have been looking at methods to convert um, voltages from a moderately high voltage bus, let's say a few hundred volts down to uh, reduce voltages for computational loads. Okay, now if you switch gears a little bit and look at parallel connected systems, you are generally looking at these types of setups for increased current handling. And one example of that is a CPU power supply. So a CPU has very low voltages. We're talking about around one volt high currents. So you can parallel connect many DC to DC converters to all share that current that's being dumped into that load. Uh, another application appears in computational settings is called point of load systems. So if you take your iPad and peel it apart and look inside of at the power architecture from the battery down to the individual sub circuits, uh, you'll oftentimes find a bus that has um, some voltage and then a bunch of DC to DC converters that hang off of that to power individual sub circuits. And the other setting is uh, I want to point out here is something that's going up in power levels, again, looking at DC microgrids. And so you have many converters here. Now, whether you're looking at a series connected setup or a parallel connected setup, the point here is that all of these systems have a considerable number of switched power converter stages. So there's a lot of switching action going on. And that opens the opportunity for what's called switch interleaving because generally switching produces undesirable harmonics, but if you have many units switching and you can spread out the instances of, of the timings by which they're switching, you can actually get some nice distortion cancellation. So we can leverage that advantage of the fact that there's a bunch of converters to achieve this. 
And now when the rubber meets the road and you say, all right, now we want to control the timing of an army of power converters to get this uh, distortion cancellation effect that I'm referring to, there's a few different ways to do that. So in this, these converters are just generic pictures. They could be DC to DC, DC to AC, whatever. This little cloud here represents that they're interconnected in some way, whether they're parallel or series. But the point still stands that you, you have only a, a few different options of how you're going to pull this off. Now, the way it's most generally done, even in industry today, is with a centralized control unit. So you have a processor that can sense what's happening at all the various converters and is actually producing the pulse width modulation timing for all of the units in the system. This is simple from a diagram perspective. You can see it's all done here, but it's complicated from the perspective of wiring. You have a bunch of noise to deal with, and you also have a single point of failure here. You don't have modularity, expandability, and all of that good stuff. So the next step up, if you want to obtain some of those benefits is to go to a distributed setup where your control functions are split apart, but here you still need a communication bus that is keeping a pulse on the timings of all of these units and is uh, performing some function to keep everything with this switch interleave timing so that they're all switching at slightly different times. Now, again, there, this introduces another um, vulnerability in the system, and there's probably, you're going to probably run into limitations of how far you can expand this. So the holy grail here is something that's decentralized. You just plug it in, it just works, and uh, they, they perform cohesively as, as a system. So this is really what we're working toward. OK, so here's a little bit of tutorial, especially for those of us who don't work with hardware and don't build things. And because um, we, we're really going to have to work with digital embedded systems and, and we have to be cognizant of their limitations. So if you have a digital control system, Usually you'll have the main core control functions. This is your dynamical controller that is shaping voltages or currents. And the arithmetic to do all of that, whether you're multiplying, adding numbers and doing all of that, those computations have to fit within uh, what are called interrupts. Otherwise you weren't able to compute, uh, complete those computations. And those interrupt intervals are generally driven by the, the periodic switch timing. So this is your heartbeat of the system. You have a, this so-called carrier system, which is it has the same frequency as the switching frequency. And that is usually triggering the analog to digital converter. And within those triggerings, you have these computations and arithmetic that are going on. And one thing that uh, you have to be careful with is, you know, if you try to solve a, a really complicated problem into here, you might not be able to finish those computations within your interrupts. So you might have to uh, trigger this every half switch cycle, every full switch cycle, or even multiple switch cycles if you have a controller that is um, particularly burdensome or if you have a very fast switching frequency. OK, so that's just a tutorial on the lay of the land here. Now, the other thing here is there is this um, part of the system that is responsible for determining the periodicity of the switching action. And that's here I've drawn it as in a diagram form very simply as an integrator. But in reality, it's a counter. And each count tick is happening every single clock cycle. And you cannot generally perform complicated computations here. It's literally just a dedicated counter. So this is open loop in the sense you can't touch it, it's just doing its thing. And this is what's producing this uh, carrier waveform that is basically a number that's 
counting up from zero up to some maximum integer. Here I draw it as one. I just scale it to make it easy to understand. And then you compare that to a duty ratio. This is a digital comparator. And there's a dedicated circuit that does this separate from all the other arithmetic. And this is what drives the switch action. OK, so this is, um, I guess, a, a tutorial on, on kind of how this is done. All right, now let's go back to the problem at hand. I want to have a controller that I strap it around my power converter, and then I interconnect it with a whole bunch of other power converters. And that magically, they all just kind of interleave and, and do that. Now, I of, of course, I'm joking here because it's there's no magic involved. What is making this happen is there has to be some sort of global information that you can see at the individual unit that allows you to perform some action that in turn drives all of them to do what you want in, in a global sense. So in a series connected setup, the global information is the current. They're all in series. In contrast, if you go to a parallel connected setup, global information is contained within the voltage. They can all see the same voltage. Now, the, I do want to clarify something here because this is gonna get into a little bit of notation is that here I have a current sensor for the series connected setup and I have what I call a filter. So this could be some sort of high pass filter, low pass filter, a notch filter. This is an op amp circuit and it's fairly easy to see it in one place. Now in the parallel connected setup, this notion of a filter is a little bit more blurry because it turns out that the load generally has a fair amount of capacitance across it in a parallel setup. So this individual filter locally installed on converter number one, it's actually not acting in isolation. It is working in tandem with this capacitor. So there is a filter between these two as well as every other filter in that same capacitor. So this is like a shared asset. And they all, there are N filters, but this is one shared component amongst all of them. Okay, so I just wanted to get that out of the way because that's a little technical detail that we'll sneak in as we work a bit further. Okay, so you're, you might be looking at this and say, well, what's the big deal here? I mean, what if you just had a system and at t equals zero, you said, okay, you're gonna be at two pi uh, over one, two pi over two, and all the way up uh, two pi over n apart, and you just stagger them over the cycle and you just start them. Well, that might sound great until you try to actually do this in an experiment and everything will be great for maybe a few seconds, but they're all gonna drift away. And the reason they're gonna drift away is because the clock oscillator that is dictating the timing of all of these are imprecise. These are not um, like quantum clocks or anything. These are just little crystal oscillators and they have some parts per million mismatch. And so if you wait a minute, they're gonna drift away. So you need some sort of corrective action. That's why you need some sort of closed loop uh, responsiveness in the system. Okay, so rather than keep you all on the edge of your seat for a half hour. Let me just give it to you right now. And then I'll show you how all of this works out. So we're gonna give you a controller at, by the end of this talk that can be implemented in a decentralized fashion. It works for both the parallel and series configurations. The implementation looks pretty much exactly the same and the implementation is quite simple. I mean, you look at it, it's, it's just a proportional controller. And the reason it's we have to keep it simple is because it's in this blue box where we can't do things like complicated arithmetic. It has to be just a simple multi multiplication that we adjust, and that's it. And now we're going to just go ahead and do some of the legwork to show how this uh, controller works. OK, so. Uh, there's two main things I want to show today. Uh, one of them is just the mathematical modeling. 
what's going on dynamically, and then we'll show some experiments. Okay, so let me give you the conceptual overview of how this works and how it's actually quite similar between both the series and parallel case. Let's look at the series connected case because that one is just easier to deal with and understand. So here we have global information. It's a current waveform. It has distortion all over it due to this collective switching action of the end converters in the system. We have this current sensor that measures that. And normally this distortion is thought of as just being garbage that you don't wanna deal with and you wanna just filter out and ignore. Now, what we're gonna do is in our sensing circuitry, we're gonna actually uh, create maybe an op amp circuit or something that is filtering out the fundamental low frequency components. It could be AC or DC. Whether it's 60 hertz or zero hertz, you filter that out and you just want to grab that noisy stuff that most people ignore. I'm going to, I'm going to call this I measured. It is the measured value of this uh, distortion component. And we're going to sample it. We have this simple proportional controller, which is adjusting the switching frequency ever so slightly away from the nominal value, which I call omega switch. And that in turn is going to the PWM stage of your embedded system. And then the closed loop action occurs because this then in turn adjusts the switching action here, which changes the current and hence you have a closed loop. Now the parallel case is just a little bit different and has one extra degree of separation we have to keep track of. So here you have a bunch of converters. They're producing uh, current waveforms that have ripple and switching. Those currents, they shoot into a common bus where a load is existing. So they sum up to give you something else. Now, this current will be divided up. There will be some that flows into the capacitor across your load and some across the load, but Nonetheless, you're gonna end up with a voltage across your load. This voltage is locally measurable by each and every power converter. We then filter out the noisy part of this because I said that that's useful. And then we sample and grab that. Now, what's interesting here is that I still call this IM, even though in actuality my filter and my sensor is measuring a voltage here. The reason I'm doing that sleight of hand is because if you think about it, this is still capturing information of this current. It is just, it, it, this information that's in this current is just being processed through the impedance of this capacitance. So it's like a filter. And then yet again, through an, another additional filter. But nonetheless, there's still current information that's hiding within that global current, because you don't want to have a sensor here that they all have access to. OK, now the other key notion here is I'm going to say that this global current that has useful information hidden in the noisy part, we're going to say that that is a broken up where the part that we care about, this noisy part, I'm going to denote it's I. And I omega is gonna be the low frequency component and we're just gonna ignore it because our um, filter will get rid of that component. Okay, so that's the main idea. Now, if you go back and look at this diagram, we, we need to find a way of how to model how this, how this overall system is coupled. Now, uh, summing up currents is extremely easy to intuit with your eyeballs for a parallel connected system. All currents just shoot into one bus, you sum them up, no big deal. But if we wanna understand how the currents are influenced in a series connected setup, it turns out that you can make it look almost exactly the same as a parallel connected setup. So if you just apply one of my favorite circuit tricks, which is superposition and say that Okay, at the end of the day, this, this, uh, this filtering action that we're doing, we only care about the high frequency component. So from a superposition standpoint, let's just forget about this low frequency component, whether it's DC or 60 Hertz or whatever it is. And 
if you do that, you can say that this is just the same as looking at a bunch of individual circuits that are doing their simple switching action. And these currents look like what you would get from uh, just basic parallel connected units, and then they sum up. And so this drawing here is just showing what this high frequency component might look like with randomized switching action. You're, they're, they're, there's nothing special is going on. And so here you can see the individual currents and how they sum up to give you some waveform. And these are the edges you can see that they're each responsible for. Now notice that they have different amplitudes, these three. Now there's two special cases where those uh, edges have equal amplitudes. One of them is the so-called interleaved state where they're all equally spread over one cycle. And this actually gives you the lowest distortion for the case that they're all pumping in identical uh, current waveforms. So this is the interleaved case, which is special, desirable, and nice. Now, the other one where they have equal amplitudes is the worst case, which is where they all switch and hit the system at the same time. So all of that distortion is reinforced and you get the largest distortion out of the three of them. Okay, so what I've done here is I kind of showed you through the physics of just superposition, the, the way currents sum up in a parallel case is just like what's happening in the series connected setup. Okay, so now we start getting into the nitty gritty of the notation here. So in the series connected setup, we have a current sensor that sees all of the current, its fundamental and low frequency components, as well as this noisy part. Uh, we, we filter this out so that we're grabbing the noisy part. Now this IM versus I is shown here graphically on this top set of waveforms. So here there is some uh, jagged edges. And here I've made it a little bit rounded to reflect the fact that this could be something that has like a, a transfer function or some other smoothing action. And it could also give you a phase shift too. So the, the actual noise and then the measured noise will be offset from one another. And what we're going to do is once you sample that, you're going to grab a one particular point that's coming from that sensor. And then you're going to adjust that to change your switching frequency. And the way I've drawn it here is that the nominal switching frequency, we're going to use that to define, you can say, a nominal reference frame. And that's what this axis is. And the switching waveform of the individual unit, so these are, this is like switching logic, is drifting at this speed, this phi dot, and its angle offset with respect to this rotating synchronous frame is denoted as phi k. Now, the thing that is super important here and what makes this non-obvious is that we're going to introduce an additional variable called phi s, which is we're going to when we have a switching edge locally at our kth unit, we're gonna wait some additional amount of time before we sample and grab um, the waveform that's uh, that noisy part of the waveform that's on our ADC pins. Okay, so there is this offset here. Now, the same thing is going on with a parallel setup. There's just that nuance I described where the uh, this filtering action and this offset is collectively produced by this capacitor and this voltage sensing circuitry, which probably has an op amp. Okay, but the same notion exists where there is still some current flowing into a load, and what is produced by the sensor is producing a filtered version of that noise. So it's all the same still. Okay, so now let's drill into these waveforms and look at them a little more carefully. Now, this notion of superposition is nice because if, if you had one single converter by itself or in parallel, 
you could say that it's switching waveform has this tri triangular looking component to it. And this is just the, the well-known Fourier series for how to uh, describe this waveform. It has some amplitude with a bunch of stuff in it. It's not a big deal. This is just the waveform emanating from the kth unit. Now, because of superposition, which applies in both a parallel and series case, we can get the total current, but we also have the, this filtering action, which in the series case is just a sensor and its filter. Parallel case, it's from the capacitor across a load as well as that filter. It's gonna give you some amplitude and a phase shift at each and every frequency. So we take that into account with these two factors floating around. Okay, oh, and, I, and I, I've also been sweeping under the rug here. We also have this duty ratio, which describes a fraction of time over which this thing is rising. Now, this measure current is something that's global. We all have identical sensors, filters everywhere. So this is the same across the entire system. Now, one thing that is uni unique is what is seen and observed at the kth ADC pin, because that one has a unique triggering instant where it actually depends on what is its, its own phase shift. Because remember, it's drifting around with respect to some synchronous frame, and they all are doing their own thing. So it samples at this time frame. They all have the same uh, phi s parameter that I'm calling here. This is this non-obvious thing that is kind of the magical thing for all of this. And then this phi kn is actually just the difference between the edge off, uh, difference between each and every unit, or the kth unit and the nth unit. And there is a capital N of them. OK, now, what is being produced by the sensor has its own frequency components. And if we look at the elf harmonic, produced by this analog sensor that's going out to our ADC pin. We can just work this out. This is nothing more than just grabbing one of the terms that's over here from the, from the Fourier series. And we're just gonna do a little bit of uh, notational massaging here. So we would like to take account for the fact that this amplitude of the various components that comprise the triangle can flip signs sometimes. So we're gonna throw an absolute sign there and then we're gonna say that we might have to account for um, a pi phase shift if, if this thing flips sign. And the reason we're doing all this work is we're going to use this way of writing things down to put things into a complex phaser. So this harmonic that is being produced by the sensor can be written as a summation of these complex phasers here. Okay, so that's a, a key notion here because once we have these phasers, now we can start to understand how they dynamically interact. So let's take a look at that. So this, all the math I just covered applies for both a parallel and series case. And the phaser for a particular harmonic of the switching frequency, so if L equals one, that is the switching frequency, two, three, four, and five and up are just multiples of the switching frequency. Th those harmonics are um, existed all of these various sensor outputs. And if you take these, um, these phasers that represent what is seen in each of the individual N sensors, you can per perform a, a vector sum. And the vector sum will give you this total uh, net phaser that tells you how much vector cancellation you're getting. If, if this amplitude is zero, they've all canceled each other. And this is for a particular harmonic. Now, it's important here to try and gain an intuition of these various 
phasers and what is desirable or necessary. So if you have a bunch of arrows in a complex space and you want them to cancel, one way to do that is by um, configuring them in what's called the phase balanced angle distribution. And you can kind of visualize this as they kind of have a, a center of mass that's sitting at the origin, but they are not, they, they can have non-equal angles that are separating them. So there, there's, there is a symmetry to it, but there are many ways to achieve this. So this is actually the first harmonic that I'm showing being canceled. Now, what about the second, third, and fourth? Okay, so let's say that this has some angle theta one. What if I multiply that by two? What if I take the angle for this vector and multiply that by two? Same for all the other angles. What do I get? Well, I would get something like this. And if you look at them and you kind of squint your eyes, you will see, they, you can just tell visually, they don't cancel. And then if I take those same angles for the original gray vectors and multiply them by three to get the third harmonic, they do something else. Okay, so the point is here that we were only able to cancel the first one. And so now let's go a step further. What would happen if you were able to cancel the first two? And remember, this is an example with six vectors. So this is like an example with six converters and I'm modeling the harmonics produced by the six sensors. All right, so now let's look at a case where we can cancel the first one. So here I've clumped up the harmonics of, um, uh, I guess, pairs of units. So this is basically like units one and two switching together, three and four switching together, five and six, and they're aligned. So this is not interleaved, but we're able to cancel the first one. If I multiply all these angles by two, they just kind of spin around and they still cancel out, so we're good, but then we multiply them by three. And aha, they are st we're still not able to get the third one. So now, if you actually try to cancel the third one now, that's done by this special interleaved state. In the controls world, they call this splay. And it's just, these vectors are spread by two pi over n. And if you take all of these angles, so angle one, two, and three, and four, and you multiply them by two, they'll spin around, they clump up on the second harmonic, but they still cancel. And then if you multiply them by three, they will cancel again. So you can work through these things and you can show that for any arbitrary number of vectors, that the only way to make sure that they are absolutely spread two pi over n is if you get this phasor vector cancellation for all harmonics up to the floor of n over two. So this floor operation just means you round down. So for six units, we have to cancel the first three. All right, so this is kind of a, a fundamental result here. Now we're going to start using this intuition to see if we can use this to arrive at a controller that will perform this auto magical function that we want. So let's dream up a potential function. Actually, we didn't have to dream it up. It's in these papers here. And in this potential function, we're going to take the harmonics from the first up to the floor of half of N. And we're basically looking at the amplitudes and then the cosine, and here's this special angle here. And it's, it, you can see that inside of this special angle, we have this, um, this offset. Remember I said that whenever there's a switch edge that happens, we wait a little bit, this phi S. It's like the sampling delay or something like that. Now, if you look at this, it, you can also just rewrite this and say, well, this is just like a, like a dot product or an inner product. So here I'm just using um, some bracket notation, say this is just like an inner product of, of two complex um, phasers. Now the thing, if you look at this, is that this potential function is zero 
only if you do indeed get zero amplitude for those first n over two uh, harmonics. So that's why it's special. Now the controller we're gonna say is gonna be derived where it is actually just the derivative of that potential function. We take the derivative with respect to the angle. So uh, there's a particular angle here where this, this theta KL is for the kth unit and then L is for the lth harmonic. And if you take a look at this and you work through the mathematics, so this is just an identity for, um, oh, actually this is just plugging in what was on their prior slide. There's an identity from uh, dealing with uh, these derivatives. And if you work through the trig, you'll arrive at this third expression. And if you look at this very closely, this factor here that has this double summation is actually just the sampled value of the first n over two harmonics. And this is what is so nice about this because this is something you get for free. It's, a, it's living in the analog world and it's just sitting there and resting at your ADC pin, just waiting for someone to take advantage of it. Now, well, if you look a, at this- a, a question about just the notation on that last slide? Yeah. Uh, the D theta subscript KL, I'm, I'm just confused by the L subscript in that derivative. I feel like it's a sum over all the harmonics rather than at one particular harmonic. Is that right? Or... Right, I think I might have neglected a summation here. Cause yeah, we, well, we don't need to get caught up on specific. Yeah, stuff. but yeah, we need to grab the, the first N over two harmonics in this. So yeah, I'll double check that. Okay, so this potential function, we, we can ensure that this potential function is always positive. If you look at the cosine argument and realize that what is living inside this cosine um, has to live in some domain so that it's positive. And this is where this phase shift, we're, remember we're, we're waiting between the, the edge and when we actually trigger the ADC is hiding inside of this phi star. And if you blow that up, and expand it, here it is. And we just need this to be between plus and minus pi over two. And you just reshuffle things, you'll arrive at some inequality for phi s. And if you just think about this, pi d is something we know locally, it lives inside of our own controller. And the rest are constants that if you've characterized your sensor, you designed it, so you should know what it's phase shift and properties are, you can compute all these and that'll give you a range over which you can pick this, this, uh, this phase shift to trigger your, your ADC. And this will ensure that you converge. All right, so that's the main idea. And so here we go. So that's where all this comes into play. And, and so this is this innocuous looking phi S which is actually the magical ingredient for all of this, and this is, I think, what makes it non-obvious and probably why it hasn't been done in the past, is here you have your, your duty ratio, you know that. This phi s is, is, um, can be defined with respect to the switch edge. You can even define it um, as another parameter um, in addition to your duty ratio. So your duty ratio is giving you the, the pulse and then you can also define something that looks like a duty ratio phi, and you can easily embed that into your digital implementation. So here we go, that's, that's the main idea. Now, let's go to the experiments in these last few minutes. So here's hardware that we built for this project, and it's, 
capable of doing all sorts of stuff. <laughs> um, you, you can do DC, AC, and we were actually originally designing this for, um, for medium voltage systems cascaded in AC systems, but we can run them as DC to DC converters. So here, what we've done is um, I've, we've rewired this thing where we basically have a single DC supply that's hiding behind these, what are called dual active bridge converters. There's five of them. And then after that, we have uh, buck converters. We connect those in series. And it, here is the, it's the magnetics here that allows us to series connect them easily. Each of these has their own controller, as you can see here. And they have their own little filter that is uh, looking at the sensed current locally. And if you now just look at uh, the measurements here, so this is capturing um, the, the current in voltage waveform. So here's the total current flowing through the system. Here's the voltage across the load, which are, what are these, uh, this magenta and bluish colors. And you can see without the controller, they're kind of more or less doing something randomized. And then once you kick this thing on, um, it's pretty quick and they will push each other away due to this repulsive coupling that happens due to the control action. And yeah, here's the two, two different uh, operations. Uh, one is for a high duty ratio and one is for a low duty ratio. So if I just toggle back and forth between this slide 37 and 36, we're just looking at uh, different duty ratios and you can sweep this through all sorts of operating points. I had the same setup. Um, so actually Soham has, has been in the lab literally like probably right now wiring this up if, if he's not watching my talk. <laughs> and uh, he, he was uh, running these as parallel connected bot converters. And uh, this is the setup. So we have another filter here that's measuring the locally available voltage. And here, this is where we were, this is so hot off the presses that we, we weren't able to get the, the measurements in place. But yeah, we have some good simulations on this. And if you were talking to me in a week from now, we'll probably have measurements. And, uh, but yeah, here, here is a, a system where you can see uh, the voltage and current that's going into a parallel connected load. And um, the overall current, this is whenever they're each more or less switching together and producing a highly distorted current at the beginning of this waveform and the envelope tails off as they push each other away and you get this nice cancellation. And the voltage across the load, um, the quality of that waveform goes up considerably as they do that. Now here's just to give you a taste of other results. I, I didn't have time to uh, uh, to work through the notation with. It's a tall order, but another thing that's really neat about this is, and probably a question someone will ask is asymmetries. How do you deal with asymmetries? Because here you have five buck converters are all pumping in the same current, but um, what do you do if you have your controller and each of these buck converters has a different uh, DC voltage hiding behind it? So. What if these have different voltages? Or what if the inductors are different? Um, what do you do in that case? So actually, so Robert and his students have figured out that for asymmetric cases that the, the perfect interleaved case that I have been heralding is this wonderful thing is actually not the best operating point for asymmetric cases. And the beautiful thing about this is we have a controller that it just does whatever it wants to do once you start it. It's out of your hands. It's localized, decentralized. And what we noticed about it is that it actually converges to a non-interleaved state in asymmetric systems. And it actually gives you a really nice distortion cancellation. So you can see here that some of these are piled up close to each other. And these would be like phasers that have different amplitudes and angles, but they are, they are maximizing their cancellation, especially on the first harmonic. So anyway, there's a whole other can of worms there I'm putting off to the side. 
And I think, yeah, that's all I got. So anyway, um, this is a good point to, to stop and take questions. So thanks everybody. Awesome, that was great. Thank you, Brandon. Um, we'll open it up to questions. I know some folks had to leave early. Um, I have a couple, but if any of the members of the audience have any, uh, feel free to, to put in the chat or, or, or chime in as well. Um, one of the things that came up uh, early on in the talk was uh, the concept of voltage and current as global information in the converter interleaving uh, for power electronics applications. And it reminded me of your work with uh, inverters and um, I guess synchronization of inverters. Because is it right to say that the global information when synchronizing inverters on a power system is actually the frequency uh, signal? Or is it still the um, a shared current in some aspect? I I'm wondering if the same uh, superposition of current applies to uh, synchronizing inverters essentially in a power system. Yeah, there's there's um, connections that that are uh, very similar between what I'm showing here and synchronizing waveforms, which is kind of the opposite objective. But yeah, totally. Um, we have KCL and KVL, which is what links everything together, and in the controllers that we've been working on, we have current uh, that is fed back. And then when we close the loop, we actuate voltage with our power converter. And, and then of course we have Kirchhoff's laws in all the Diffie cues that tie everything together. And so in this case, there is global information in that current that we're feeding back because we're actuating voltage. But yeah, that's a, a nice little connection. So thanks for bringing that up. Yeah, no, I, I think that that's really cool. Um, and then a, a next question is, uh, do you have next plans for this? So I know it's like literally coming off the press, the hardware <laughs> demonstration right now, as we speak in a different room. <laughs> um, do <laughs> right, do you yeah. know where you're gonna take this idea next? I mean, as you said, it's novel. Um, and so I don't think folks have seen this before. And I imagine people in the industry will certainly be interested. Yeah, so once we get the measurements for the parallel case, um, we're also going to get measurements for how we can deal with AC waveforms too. Because um, if you're looking cool. at DC, DC um, as, as shown in these experiments, we're running these as DC to DC converters. Um, that's one thing. And that, that'll really allow us to take this from um, series and parallel connected DC to DC, as well as DC to AC converters. And then hopefully we can start uh, looking at all those applications on the first couple slides and start taking deep dives into those applications and how these can start working their way down into there. So yeah, that's probably um, the big picture of where I see this going. Do you imagine it to be different uh, in creating say, uh, like an AC waveform in, in a set of interleaved inverters or, or with the, um, I guess the signal that's, that's canceled out, whether it's the, the, I guess in the case of inverters would be the 60 Hertz waveform, right? Um, yeah, so let me see here, hold on. Because I'm, I'm sure in practice there are always differences, but. Uh, yeah, okay, so this is I think a good picture to maybe touch on what you're describing. So there's, there's different time scales here. So this control loop is basically nudging the rate at which they're switching ever so slightly. And this is really to get these edges spread apart so that we get, um, instead of a switched waveform that is going from some hard level to a very different voltage hard level, they're switching at in-between points. And 
this sinusoidal shape is actually due to another time scale and another control loop that's completely different. So that would be due to what I would call this main waveform control. Got it. So th this thing is shaping uh, the overall 60 hertz waveform or whatever it is, whereas this, well, I guess this is not the actual controller, but this is shaping those uh, edge dynamics. Mm -hmm. Yeah, got it. So, so you, you anticipate that there might be interactions between uh, the two control loops or are they on such different time scales that that isn't Yeah, so the intention here is that these live on such disparate time scales yeah. that they more or less are just don't, doing their own thing without even realizing the other one exists. Yeah. Now, the, the only thing that we have to do is this phi s does need to be updated as the duty ratio is moving around in time because we have that inequality we have to meet. And so um, w you can actually adjust this phi s to track the duty ratio plus some offset or something like that. Okay. And do you have a slide that describes I, I, I'm, uh, that I lost track of the difference between phi one and phi s? I know they're both phase shifts. Do you have a slide that? Yeah. Uh, perhaps other people have this question yeah, too. Actually, so uh, le let me just show one thing real quick. The actual implementation before I show that is you have a nominal switching frequency that lives in all of them. Here's the slight nudging or offset of that switching frequency. And this is how it's truly implementa implemented. We add them together, and then this is going to a counter. I drew it ideally as a. As is a k a constant? It is. Yeah. K? Okay. Yeah. It's a fixed constant. Um, okay, now this is. So you're controlling the derivative of the uh, phase, basically. So you're controlling the frequency based off that IS signal. Yep, yep. Yeah. And this Partially. diagram here is a way of kind of visualizing it. It's kind of like this. Omega switch times time is, is kind of like a common thing that they're all drifting along on. And this is the only local thing is, is telling you how that local edge is drifting relative to this same global that they're all dealing with. So does Fias, um, does that contain the global information, the Fias? Or am I misinterpreting? Um, not not really. The the oh wait the the phi s is is something. It's a parameter. It's we a pick. parameter. Okay. Yeah, and it is something that we pick, and it is a it is just describing that time interval from our edge to when we grab the sample. Yeah. And that parameter is chosen to satisfy this guy. Okay. And then on the next, does this change? In, this doesn't change in time. This just changes based on the, inter, the desired interleaving structure. Right? It, it, the only thing that could cause it to change in time is if the duty ratio is changing in time. So, like if that multi level waveform has a it. 60 hertz uh, shape to it, this will actually be moved around at 60 hertz. Yeah. Cool. So, the switching That's frequency really cool. will be hovering at uh, it'll it, it could have the same frequency if if the duty ratio is has an ac component to it this will yeah. also have a small ac component your, your your switching frequency could be right around 10 or 20 kilohertz and it'll breathe ever so slightly around that frequency so that's why on the next slide uh slide 33 i think uh yeah slide 33 bias is fed into uh the s over h block because it could change essentially it's not um, yes. For, whereas if you're tracking, if the duty cycle is uh, constant, you wouldn't really need to feed phi s. You would just have to, but s, over, s over h block would just have to know phi over s or phi mm -hmm. s. Yeah, the only simplification here is I'm not showing how you would have to take the duty ratio and maybe some yeah. information you know about your sensor and then compute that. But it's a pretty easy thing to, uh, to ascertain. Okay. okay. Well, I've talked way too much. We have uh, two questions and, and sorry, but those are, I don't know, that really cleared it up. Thank you. Gabriel, okay, would you yeah, like to ask course. your question? Yeah. Um, hi, Professor Johnson. Thanks. Thanks for the talk. Um, so um, please correct me if, if I say something wrong, but I, uh, 
in, in understanding, you know, it seems that, um, you know, this work is, is, is based on, like the idea is like harmonic cancellation, right? Um, and so I was wondering how you think this would uh, interact with like controllers for like um, stability of, of, of inverters like after faults, for example, um, like where the goal is to like reestablish that like, you know, 60, 60 hertz um, voltage waveform. And, and perhaps if you see like potentially um, like applications of like hierarchies, you know, maybe like this is one that's like, oh, like once you're in steady state and like you have that 60 waveform, like this one can kick in for like harmonic cancellation because like after a fall, like your immediate priority to like recover from it. So if you could like um, perhaps speak to that and, and like mm -hmm. how you expect those interactions to, to take place. Yeah, I think here the vision is that these will be performing their functions in a, in a decoupled manner where let's say you have an AC power system and you want to keep everything synchronized and deal with faults and transients and load steps. Uh, this controller would live upstairs. It's dealing with things, I would say, at the millisecond and slower time scale. And that's kind of just humming along. And this other control loop is, is it's kind of um, unaware of all those dynamics because the filter is designed to get rid of low frequency components. There might be edges if there's like a large load step or something that sneak in, but those will be momentary disturbances. So those won't have much of an impact on the system. So yeah, I'm actually thinking that because of the time scale separation, this is, we really don't have much of a need for hierarchies and, and ways of kind of linking these up. Um, I mean, of course, I'm all ears. Maybe there's some clever ideas that uh, you can help me come up with and we could explore that. Yeah, I don't know, but that, make, that makes <laughs> sense. Yeah, you're, you're suggesting that um, like the filtering like takes care of that. Um because yeah, you're, by, by filtering out like um, the different frequencies, you're essentially like taking care of like the time scale separation issue. Right. Yeah, yeah okay, thank you, thank you, great talk. Gabriel, this is on the same time scale as your uh, interest in, I guess the hybrid modeling of inverters though, so it might be worth looking. Yeah. So we had another question from uh, Venkat, uh, well actually two, uh, would, would you like to read them? Let me see here. Um, the chat window is hiding from me. Or, or Venkat could read him out loud. He's unmuted. Oh, actually, I found it. Or Venkat, yeah, yeah. Let, let's just hear it. <laughs> Hi, Brian. Thank you very much for a wonderful presentation. Uh, I have a couple of questions related to the parallel connected converter. Mm -hmm. uh, one is uh, uh, since you're primarily interested in the high frequency component in the voltage uh, that you're measuring as a global variable. Uh, does a very high value of load capacitance impact your measurement uh, because it kind of you know, uh, sucks in all those current ripple and it doesn't give you the necessary high frequency ripple that you are looking for? Uh, so will a, high, will a high value of output capacitance cause some sort of challenge in this technique? That is one question. Uh, the other question is how does the, uh, you know, uh, the, the parasitics in the output capacitor, for example, it can have ESR and ESL, uh, those things, if you include, then the, the kind of ripple that you see across the cap uh, might be slightly different. So how do these two things uh, affect the performance of the edge controller for interleaving? Thank you. Yeah, so great question. Because um, indeed, if, if you make this capacitor larger and larger, never larger, eventually the, this uh, ripple part will be diminishing in size. And when you have an ADC, you have a finite number of bits. So DSPs generally have like 12 bits or some low cost microcontrollers even eight bits. So if you're trying to feed a signal into that and you're, 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 you need to fully utilize those number of bits so you can even discern what is going on. Now, the solution to this is, is actually handled in the analog domain. So the way to deal with this is, you would, this filter would be an RC circuit 
where the capacitor in that RC circuit blocks the DC component and the resistor would experience just the ripple. And then you could strap an op amp across that resistor, which is, you can say, scaling or amplifying just that noisy part that we love and care about, such that when you feed that to your ADC pin, you're utilizing all the bits on that uh, uh, analog to digital converter. So the, the main solution to here is on how you design things in the analog domain. Uh, the other question is, okay, so what if this is, uh, has other characteristics or resistances and things like that? Well, in that case, you, you, you will have to characterize your sensor and those would sneak into these amplitudes and phase shifts here. So you could measure those. And if you have uh, N units, you just need to characterize that or model that for the, the first N over two harmonics. And once you know that, then you're good to go. As long as you satisfy this inequality. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Brian. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Well, I think we're over time, so we'll thank the speaker. Uh, that was a really great talk, Brian. Great. Well, it's a lot of fun. You guys were the, the first guinea pigs of this talk. Um, I was getting tired of giving the same seminars, and <laughs> it's a lot of work to make a new presentation, but uh, oh, yeah. Fun. <laughs> so, anyway, thanks, everybody. Of course, and uh, I imagine you'll get more questions once we post the recording. So, yeah.